Amen. It's good to see all of you. Happy Father's Day. Wow. You all are a nice looking group. You really clean up well. Hebrews chapter 4 this morning as we continue our series in the book of Hebrews. Thank you, Nicole and worship team, for the wonderful worship. Thank you, Brian, for your assistance this morning in our child dedication. And I just have to say, as I look out on the crowd this morning, it is good to see Ray here this morning. God bless you. So glad to have you here this morning. Well, I, I am really glad. I'm always excited to be here to share God's word with you, but I, I really am this morning because I think this passage will be an encouragement to you, as I think the Word of God should be an encouragement to us. So in Hebrews chapter 4, the author is reaching out to a group of people who are struggling right now. They're not in a good place spiritually. They have, at, at some point in their life, they have embraced Jesus Christ, but they are on the brink of not continuing to follow him and, and go forward in their spiritual life. They're, they're thinking about sort of abandoning it all and eventually going backwards. So they're not in a good place. And, and the author comes in at this point of his letter and says, here's probably one of the main reasons why you're not in a very good place. Because you're trying to do this life. You're trying to follow Jesus and all of this on your own. You're, you're trying to do it in your own power and in your own strength and out of your own wit and wisdom. And he's saying, look, in this life, even as Christians who have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ, we need his help every day, every moment of the day. So I want to direct your eyes to the very last three words of chapter 4 of Hebrews, where in the Net Bible it says, we need help. <laughs> That's our plight as human beings. Whether we're Christian or not, we need to come to an understanding and an acknowledgement that on this earth, to live life, to navigate life, we need help. We need outside of ourselves a power greater than ourselves. We do. Now, many human beings have too much pride to acknowledge that. They're like, I can handle life and anything that life throws at me on my own. I submit to you today that in the midst of that kind of sort of humanistic philosophy, what are we seeing even in our world today? There is even an increase and in rise in suicide, in drug addiction. When you look around at all the broken, hopeless people in this world today, and maybe you're in that category this morning because you have come to a place where life has handed you a circumstance, a season, a trial, a situation, or maybe it's just the everyday grind that has ground you down because you're trying to do this life on your own. And the plight that the author of Hebrews is trying to get his readers to see and to acknowledge is, I need help. We all need help. We need to learn to navigate life from a power greater than ourselves outside of ourselves. So that's the first place that he goes. And you'll notice in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore we must be wary that while the promise of entering his rest remains open, none of you may seem to have come short of it. We talked about this last week. He's using the Israelites as an example from history. He says they were set free from slavery in Egypt by God through the leadership of Moses. So equate that with salvation. He says, but they never entered the promised land. They wandered. They roamed in the wilderness for 40 years. And even after that generation died off, 
And this next generation under the leadership of Joshua finally went into the promised land. They never inhabited all that God had for them. They never embraced all that God had for them. Why? Well, much of the reason is because they tried to approach life and do life on their own. Remember what the spies came back and said when Moses sent them out the very first time? Yes, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, and it's everything God promised us. But there are giants in the land, and they are stronger than we are. They were looking at life simply through their own perspective and their own eyes and from their own position of strength or lack of it and all of that, and they never, ever experienced all that God had for them. They never entered into their promised land. And I shared last week how many individual Christians never experienced their individual promised land because I believe that God has a promised land for every one of us. And he also has a promised land for us as a community of believers. He wants to take this church, this community of believers, to a certain place. But so many local churches and so many individual Christians never get there. And one of the reasons why is because we try to do it on our own. We try to do it in our own power and strength. And that's why many people are coming short of it. They never experience it. They never realize their potential that God has placed within them because they're only living life on their own. Then we see in this passage also, in verses 14, 15, and 16 of chapter 4, our partnership in this plight. Because you'll notice the plural pronouns here that he uses. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, then he says, let us hold fast to our confession. For verse 15, we do not have a high priest. Then verse 16, let us. And then finally that last phrase, we, we, let us. What's he saying? He's saying that as we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ in this partnership, there's only two ways that this partnership with all of us is going to go. Either we are being an influence positively on each other to live more and more dependently on God, or as we come together, we are negatively influencing one another to live more and more independently of God. Because all of us need help. It's not like God is saying, well, now, you know, you need help over there, but this brother or sister doesn't need help. All of us are in the same plight, regardless of whether, you know, how, how long we've followed Christ, how long we've been a Christian, all of that. We're, we still need help every day to be able to live. And many Christians especially, sad to say, will not acknowledge that. In fact, let me give you a sort of a commercial for Wednesday night. We got two more Wednesdays to go, and it's been good up to this point. You all have been faithful. And I know it's going to be like 130 degrees on Wednesday. <laughs> but it'll be cool in the cafeteria. But on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about an indispensable characteristic that is necessary for us to have in our Christian life in order for God to really use us. Hope you'll come back Wednesday and hear what that characteristic is. But anyway, the author is saying, look, we can't do this on our own. And when we come together, we've got to be conscious of the fact that the way I am living my life, I'm either being an example to my other brothers and sisters in Christ, us, we, that I am a person that's seeking to live dependently on God because I'm seeking his help over and over and all the time, or I am communicating to my brother and sister in Christ that I can do this on my own. I, I don't need you, my brother or sisters. I don't really come to God that often for his help. I got this. I can handle this, you see. 
So it's very important that we understand that dynamic because obviously God's goal is that when his people come together, we are actually rubbing off on each other in a positive way, meaning that we are encouraging one another to live more and more dependently on God rather than independently of God, and that we're encouraging one another to reach out and Again, support and encourage one another and not try to do this on our own. The Bible commands us as brothers and sisters in Christ, bear one another's burdens. And sad to say, I've been a Christian for now 45 plus years and been in church for that long and more. And one of the sad things that I've seen in my lifetime is that there are so many Christians that will not allow other Christians to come in to bear their burdens. Too much pride. Because somehow we bought the lie that, well, if I seek for others' help, they're going to think I'm weak. Or that there's something wrong with me. Well, the Bible says we all need help. And so then, therefore, those of us who may be in a place where we are bearing those burdens, we should never come across like, well, I'm helping you now, but I'll never need your help. <laughs> because maybe I'm going through a season right now where I could help you, but I might turn around in a couple months or a year from now, and maybe I need your help. Because we all need the help of God every day, and we all need to come from that place where we need each other as well. That's why he says, let us do these things, not just me. So we see our plight, our partnership in this plight. Then we see our purpose in receiving, especially God's help. And that is at the end of verse 14 where he says, let us hold fast to our confession. See, when you and I became a Christian, obviously we had an initial beginning confession with God. We came to God, basically acknowledged our sin, the fact that you and I could not earn or merit our salvation and that we needed a power greater and beyond ourselves to be saved, to deliver us from the penalty, power, and one day from the very presence of sin. So we cried out to God. We said, God, I need you as my Savior. I cannot do this on my own. I cannot save myself. And that's great. That's where it all starts. But see, like many Christians, the author is trying to remind his readers, you realize that, yes, there was that moment in time where as a Christian you cried out to God to save you, but you realize that the effects or results of that salvation are played out or manifested every day so that, yes, I don't have to get saved over and over again, if you know what I mean. It's not like we have to be saved through our lifetime 50, 20, you know, 25 times. I get saved positionally once. But let's not forget that the Bible teaches that even as a saved Christian who is now in right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, I still have this flesh. I still have this fallen sinful nature. And therefore, I also, throughout my entire life on earth, even as a Christian, I need saving. I need delivering. I need rescued by God all the time. Yes, the once that I call out to him, that's a one-time thing. But I still need delivered. I still need rescued. I still need strengthened by God. I need his wisdom. I need, his, I need him even after I'm saved. And the sad thing is, just like with the readers of this letter, what had happened was they allowed God to save them, bring them out of, you know, slavery. But then they basically turned to God and said, OK, God, I got it from here. You know, now, now I've, my sins are forgiven. I'm in a right relationship with you. I know I'm going to heaven when I die type of thing. But now, God, the rest of my life, I got it from here. I'll take it. And that's the way many Christians live their lives today. That's where the readers of this letter were. That's why they were struggling so much. Because they came to God initially and said, God, I need your help to be saved. But then the rest of their life, they were like, but God, I don't need you anymore. I got this on my own. 
I don't need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't need you. I got this. And their life started to go like this. And life became more and more overwhelming, more and more unmanageable. And that's why he says, here's the purpose of why I'm writing this to you. We must hold fast to our confession. We must faithfully continue to follow Jesus Christ every day of our life. And the only way that we can do that, even as saved people, is by the help of Almighty God. So that's where he starts. Let me give you the real encouraging news, though, this morning. I want you to see, beginning in verse 16 of chapter 4 of Hebrews, the permission we have from God to seek the help that we need. Notice what he says. Let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. I want to zero in on two words that speak about the permission that God is giving to us as the children of God. First of all, it is the word confidently. It means without reservation. If you are a child of God here this morning, do you know that God gives you a lifetime permission, basically a pass, to say to you, you can come to me without reservation. And then he adds the word whenever. It means at any time. So at any time of my life, throughout my life, for the whole of my life, you and I have permission from God to approach him for help. There, there's only a couple reasons why Christians struggle. Okay? There's only a couple reasons why. I, I'm either trying to do life on my own without the help of God, or I have gotten to a place with my bad thinking where I think he is unwilling to help me or he's not able to help me. That's really it. That's where it really comes down to. And this passage of Scripture is basically blowing all those arguments away. All that bad thing away. First of all, saying, no, we do need his help. All of us need his help. And secondly, that he is more than willing and able to help us. So if, if we're living a moment of our life, if we're living a day of our life on our own without the help of God, that's not on God, nor is it on anybody else. It's on us. Because we have been taught in his word and given permission by God himself. You come to me at any time without reservation. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of my son has cleared that way. We don't enter the presence of God based upon our own merit. That's why we know we can come confidently. Do you know that this morning? Do you know this morning that you can come to God at any time in your life without reservation because of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ has paved the way. I love what Paul said in Romans 5, 2 to the Romans. He said, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Access to God. We can approach God at any time. How, how are we able to do that? By the faith that we placed in Jesus Christ to open up that way to God. Just as the veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom at the temple when Jesus was, was crucified, God was Sharing with everybody, the way to me has been opened through my son. Come through him. Which is exactly what Jesus said in John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. But the flip side of that is if I come by Jesus Christ, I can come anytime without reservation. Are we coming to God because we've been granted permission to come? And then secondly, notice in this passage of Scripture in verse 16, we have a place to come for help. 
The place is described here as the throne of grace. So many people, when they think about the symbol that manifests God's presence and power, the throne, they think about judgment. And the Bible does talk about the fact that for some who choose to separate themselves from God and live apart from God and not accept his offer of salvation or help or anything in their life, that's fine. They will one day stand before that throne of judgment because they chose to take upon themselves everything instead of giving God the opportunity to save them. And if they don't want God in their life, God says, fine, you can live for the rest of eternity without me. There you go. But for those who know the Lord, for those who are children of God, not only are we given permission, but he describes that the place we can come always to get this help is the throne of God's grace. Let me say a couple things about this. First of all, the word throne is important because, again, it speaks of God's symbolic manifested presence and power over all things. So what he's saying is you realize that you and I cannot come to, to ask for help from anyone higher than God who's on his throne. There is nothing greater in the universe than the throne of God. Therefore, I don't care what is bothering you, what is hanging you up, what you're struggling with in this life, what's gotten the best of you for now, you are able and I am able through the blood of Jesus Christ to come to his throne. And nothing is too hard or difficult for him. And therefore I should be encouraged by the fact that I can appeal to no greater one than God on his throne. I might be looking for help with other people, but, and maybe they can help me to a point, but they're not over the whole universe like God is. He's on his throne, and because I'm his child, it's a throne of grace. The word grace not only speaks about God's favor that is dispensed to us who are undeserving, it also speaks about his supernatural assistance. He's saying, you realize, child of God, that you and I at any time can confidently, without reservation, come to this throne and get supernatural assistance, not just human assistance. Supernatural assistance to be able to navigate life. Again, let me go back to the beginning of my message. This is why so many people today, life is overwhelming them while they are being crushed under life, why they are turning to drugs and alcohol and why they are killing themselves in record numbers and why they can't handle life and why they live in fear every day and let, you know, whatever is happening in the news today just drive them crazy and cause them stress and anxiety and all of these things. Why? Because we're living by ourselves rather than living with the help that God is so graciously offering us. Supernatural assistance. And then he says this, and you'll also come to this throne of grace and receive mercy, which is so cool. It means God is going to be actively compassionate towards us even when we fail and even if we're failing, even in the midst of our failure. If we come to him, we will always receive mercy. Not judgment. Not condemnation, but mercy. God is just waiting for the opportunity for us to turn to him and say, God, I need you. I need you. I have failed over and over and over again, but I know even if I failed you a million times, I can confidently come without reservation because I'm not coming because I deserve it. I'm coming because I know Jesus Christ has paved the way for me to come. And I'm coming to you now, God, to your throne of grace. And I'm asking for your grace and your mercy. 
And then one last thing that the author of Hebrews tells us, which is most important, is he says, and when we come to that throne, there's a person that we can come to, a person who is more than willing and able to help us. Notice he describes him in verse 14. He says, therefore, since we as brothers and sisters in Christ have not just a high priest, a great high priest, a high priest was one who represented men and women before God and to God. He says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Notice what he says in verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses. Jesus is saying to us, I feel what you feel. I am moved by the things that move you. I'm affected by the things that affect you. I am able to empathize and sympathize with you. I know what it's like to be human, not just because I'm God and I created human beings, but because I became fully human in my incarnation in Bethlehem. I am the God man. I know what it's like to be human. I get it. And he says, so when you come to me, you will know that you're coming to someone who understands and gets it. Yet, he goes on to say, yet was put to the test more than you and I ever could be. Yet without sin, Jesus never failed once. So he's saying, why wouldn't we come to someone who never failed? Because he can help. He knows, how to, he knows how to do this better than anyone because he was put to the test over and over and over again and yet never failed. And he says, I'm, I'm willing and able to help you. I put myself in the best possible position in the universe. I am now at the right hand of God, my Father, to help you. That's the person we have to help us. No greater person could we have helping us in this life than our Lord Jesus Christ, which leads me to share with you a couple of the verses out of the book of Hebrews that are so encouraging for me. If you go over to the book of, or to, you are in the book of Hebrews, to chapter 9, look at verse 24. Chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, the representation of the true sanctuary, but into heaven itself to appear now in God's presence for us. What's Jesus doing now? Is he just hanging out there? You know, kicking back, just waiting for the world to end type of thing? No. Jesus Christ has an every moment present ministry. What is it? His ministry didn't end when he ascended back to heaven. His ministry is ongoing for us. He's appearing face to face with God in heaven on our behalf. That's what he's there to do to place himself in the best possible position in the universe to help us. And then if you go back to chapter 7, verse 25 of Hebrews, I love this too. The author says, so he, speaking about Jesus, is able, by the way, that's present tense, he is continually able to save completely. The word means entirely. It means through everything. I even like the King James translation of this. To the uttermost. Jesus Christ isn't just able to save. He's able to completely save. To perfectly save. To entirely. In other words, when God, when Jesus delivers us, he really delivers us. When he rescues us, he really rescues us. When he saves us, when he strengthens us, he strengthens us from his unlimited strength. Which is why Paul could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is no better Savior, Deliverer, Rescuer than Jesus Christ. But notice this. He is able to save completely those who come. And by the way, that word is also in the present tense, meaning those who continually come to him. It's not just learning to come to Jesus or come to God in the moment that I am becoming a Christian and now resting my faith in him for my initial salvation. That's great, and that's where it all starts. But the author of Hebrews is saying, you realize that's just sort of the beginning of our saving, right? 
Because as fallen human beings, even though now we are in right relationship with God, even as Christians, we need saving and delivering and rescuing and strengthening and comforting and wisdom imparted to us and all of these other things every day or else our life will start to slide really bad. Because if we're willing to get rid of our pride and admit it, we need outside of ourselves a power greater than ourselves to navigate life on earth, even as a child of God. Am I continually coming to him? And then he goes on to say this. So he is able to save completely those who will come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Let me share with you what the word intercede means. Most Christians just take it at face value and say, well, that's encouraging to me. That means Jesus is praying for me. And that's exactly right. That's one of the aspects of this word. It means that every day, whether you realize this or not, Jesus Christ himself, your Lord, your Savior, is praying for you in heaven. I hope that will encourage you. You're not dealing with life every day on your own. Jesus Christ is up there praying for you. But it also means more than that. And I love this aspect. Think of the word intercede. It could also be translated intervention. God wants to not only intercede on our behalf, he wants to intervene on our behalf. So the word speaks about this. Think of it this way. I'm draw, I want to draw a picture in your mind. There's a boardroom in heaven. A boardroom that only God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit can enter. And the Bible is basically saying this here. That, be, that for us, the whole Godhead meets on our behalf and makes a decision as a Godhead about what is the best action they can take as the Godhead for you and I. That's pretty cool. I mean, think about it. I'll just use myself as an example. That means that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit get together and go, okay, what can we do for Jeff? And I want you to put yourself in there. They do this. That's what it means. That's what Paul meant in Romans when he says God is able to work all things together for good to those that love him. They will get together as the God. You want to talk about brain power. You want to talk about someone that knows exactly what's the best course of action to take for us. It's God. And the Bible says they're all involved. They all come together and meet on our behalf, not only praying for us, but coming together as the Trinity and basically saying, what can we do for them? How can we, how can we minister to them most effectively? And they plan a course of action for each of us. That's how much each of us, as the children of God, mean to each of them. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So let me go back now to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And let me read these three verses now together as one. And as we read these together, I'm hoping that as your eyes go down through these words, that maybe they will carry a little bit more of meaning and significance to you after the thoughts that I've shared this morning. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. I'm going to ask you to stand and as the worship team comes. I'm going to ask us to bow in prayer at this moment. Here's what I want to say to each of us this morning. 
Each of us have come here this morning at some different place in our life. Either we, by God's help, living dependently on God every day, are remaining above it all, so to speak, being able to rise above our circumstances and being able to navigate life. Or we have come here in some form today where we have been trying to do life on our own. And life and the things that life are bringing into our lives, it's getting the better of us. It's overwhelming us. It's discouraging us. We're struggling. So I want to just ask all of us today, not only where are we at, but for all of us to realize that there's not one of us here today that doesn't need the help of God. We all do. It's just a matter of are we willing to acknowledge it? And then do we realize through especially the truth of God's word today that God is more than willing and able to help us if we will just approach him and just say, God, I need you. I, I need your help. I cannot do this life any longer on my own. So here's what I'm going to ask before we sing this last song. With everyone in an attitude of prayer and eyes are closed, only I am looking around at this point. Would there be any here today that would say, ultimately to the Lord, not to me, Lord, I'm being moved right now to ask for help. There's something specific in my life that I, I need your help, and I've been trying to do this on my own, and I have come to this place where I'm, I'm surrendering to you, and, and I realize I need that. Here's what I'm going to ask anyone in that position this morning. And I realize, again, all of us could raise our hand at this point. All of us need his help. But maybe there's some here this morning that you just specifically, particularly, you're being moved to come to God this morning for some specific reason to ask for his help. Would you simply reach up to him and reach up your hand and put it up? Say, God, I, I need, I'm reaching up my hand to you today, God. I, I'm, I'm lifting up my hand to you, reaching out to you, saying, God, would you help me today? By doing that, we're saying, God, we need your help. You may put your hands down. As we sing this last song this morning, Maybe some of you are being led by the Holy Spirit or moved to come here and just sort of say to the Lord, Lord, I, I'm coming also to lay aside my pride and to call out for your help this morning, to ask for your help for something in my life. You come as we sing this last song this morning. <laughs>